Everybody and welcome to the weekly message for The Table. The Table is a church in Davenport, Iowa, where people are moving from greed toward generosity, from violence toward peacemaking, from isolation toward neighborliness, and from fear toward faith. I'm Pastor Rob Leverage, and it's good to be with you on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. We are going into the week of Thanksgiving, so I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving this coming Thursday, and also to let people know that next Sunday we will not be having a, uh, a typical weekly message on our YouTube channel and, and podcast. Instead, uh, I'm just actually taking some downtime next Sunday and spending some 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 much needed rest time with my family. So I'll see you again in two weeks, and then at that time, I've got a very uh, exciting and fun announcement uh, to share. Um, with our online community about uh, next steps for our church. So stay tuned for that. Our scripture reading today comes from Psalm 100, and it is, as you will uh, probably recognize uh, listening to it, it is chosen especially for the week of Thanksgiving. It is Psalm 100. Let's open our ears, open our hearts, and give a good listen. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, that it is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love is endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the Thanksgiving holiday comes around each year, Americans typically recall the history of the pilgrims, or at least part of it. Uh, The pilgrims who celebrated the first Thanksgiving with their new native friends in 1621 after they had sailed across the ocean in the Mayflower to a land that uh, is now part of Massachusetts, uh, they had had a horrendous first year in this new environment, and they celebrated a big harvest at the end of that, um, that they had made it through, right? And so we have cartoons and decorations and elementary school art projects every year commemorating this story, right? We usually don't hear much about the American Civil War around Thanksgiving. But perhaps that should be part of our storytelling this time of year as well. Because the celebrations that we know today, meaning like family gatherings on the fourth Thursday of November, well, this can be traced to a presidential proclamation made by Abraham Lincoln in the year 1863. Now, there had already been various traditions in different places around the United States uh, to have days of Thanksgiving, right? And in fact, presidents had uh, at various times declared like a day of national Thanksgiving. Congress had issued some, some things to this effect as well. These would be like announcements about like a one-off event, you know, and it happened, you know, occasionally here and there, right? Um, so Lincoln himself did not, he didn't like come up with the idea <laughs> of having a feast celebration for Thanksgiving, but it was after Lincoln's proclamation that the celebrations in November became a national yearly tradition and eventually a national holiday. I find it extremely meaningful to contemplate the fact that Lincoln (laughs) was inspired to urge the nation to give thanks to God for a rich abundance of blessing in the midst of the Civil War the most devastating internal conflict our nation has ever known. Actually, um, Lincoln, to to give a little bit more context in history, um, Lincoln made the the proclamation about Thanksgiving after being urged for years in letters and editorials by uh, a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale, 
uh, she was, I guess what you would call a Thanksgiving activist. It was very, very important to her to, to see this uh, as a tradition embraced across the nation. And uh, so she's actually probably the individual who deserves the most credit for Thanksgiving becoming a national holiday. And what's what's fascinating to me about this is that she worked at the mission of, of getting a national Thanksgiving day for decades. This was like a major project in her life. And she had actually petitioned several presidents before Lincoln. But it wasn't until the middle of the Civil War that she succeeded in her quest or in her mission, right? She got the President of the United States to embrace her idea about Thanksgiving. And that is just so compelling to me. Um, Lincoln's proclamation was issued three months to the day, actually, after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so Hale's Thanksgiving breakthrough happened in a very war-weary moment. I highly recommend that you read the text of Lincoln's uh, proclamation on Thanksgiving. Uh, you can just Google it. It'll, it'll show up. It is rich and beautiful, and it is heavy, okay? So the proclamation opens with a very long paragraph with those kind of like crazy old-timey uh, loquacious sentences that like twist around like pretzels <laughs> and and in this intro he he is enumerating the ways that God's grace is evident throughout the nation despite the reality of the war okay um, Lincoln basically says in like 15 different ways <laughs> that he says basically think of all the terrible things that could be happening right now um, on top of all the terrible fighting but they are not happening Drought, uh, famine, plagues, lawlessness, attacks from foreign enemies. There is so much awful stuff that we have been spared the last couple of years. And there is so much that is going well in our land, despite the war, right? And then he kind of goes in a direction I maybe wouldn't expect, he says that the things that are going well are not going well because we deserve it. <laughs> In fact, and, and it's amazing to me that this is coming from the desk of the President of the United States, okay? Uh, but in this proclamation, Lincoln says, we are experiencing God's wrath in the horrors of the war and that it is punishment for our sins as a nation. But even in the midst of that, we see evidence all around of God's mercy. Yeah. At the end of his uh, long introduction is my favorite line from the whole proclamation. And here it is. Um, the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. Wow. I, I love those words. They're so humble. They're so simple and so bold. He's basically saying, what are we celebrating here? Um, we are celebrating that we think our country will survive and that we will have more freedom over time. Um, in the proclamation, Lincoln speaks of the tragedy of the war. But he doesn't vilify the people who are presently fighting against the army of the United States. He clearly still sees himself as the president of all of the people who live in the states that are trying to secede from the United States. He understands that he is the president of every young man wearing a Confederate uniform, which means <laughs> somehow, ultimately, they are not the enemy, despite their formation against him on the battlefields. Okay? I, I don't know how Lincoln was able to maintain that perspective and that composure, 
But that was his conviction. And he believed that gratitude, thanksgiving, praise <laughs> to Almighty God could and should be a unifying force and a balm of healing for a divided nation. That thanksgiving can bring people together. That's what he believed. Okay. It's a challenging proposition, I have to say. Uh, because Thanksgiving is an entirely different concept than the things that we typically think bring people together. Okay? If you make like if you were to make a list <laughs> of things that unite people, um, gratitude would would be an odd duck for that list. Um, what do we usually think brings people together? Um, you might say a common identity. Uh, if we're from the same place, we wear the same colors at a football game, speak the same language, eat the same food, like the same movies, whatever. You could say that that shared identity brings us together. Um, you could also say that those things don't bring us together. They're just the evidence that we are together, right? Um, and so people can argue that point. Um, it's like uh, everybody being the same is not a force for unity. It's just a... Uh, a sign of some kind of, uh, I don't know, monoculture. I don't know. But certainly people are brought together by common goals, right? Common interests. If somebody can help you to make money, to complete some project, um, to achieve some success, you can overcome your differences in pursuit of whatever you're trying to attain together, right? That is a, a way that people are brought together. But sadly, one of the most effective ways to unify people, to bring people together, is to give them an enemy, right? If there is somebody that we can agree to hate together, then it's easier for you and me to be unified. We stand side by side when we face a bad guy that needs to be defeated. For example, um, in war, <laughs> the United States and the Soviet Union were allies when they fought against the Nazis, right? Common enemy makes friends. But soon after World War II, the Soviets became the enemy. And then having the Soviet Union as the enemy was itself the basis of many alliances that the U.S. then had with other countries throughout the second half of the 20th century. So sharing an enemy brings people together. But of course, Lincoln understood that he did not have the option in his time of uniting people against a common enemy because the enemy <laughs> was part of the family, right? It was part of the nation, part of the people. Them is us, right? It's hard <laughs> um, to remember that they are us. It's hard to maintain the belief that someone is yet your neighbor, your friend, your kindred, when anger and conflict have passed a certain point. Okay? You may have experienced this in your family, right? When they're was a conflict and emotions got to be so high, people were so angry, and at some point you, you were feeling shaky about the whole enterprise of your family. You looked around and you asked, are we gonna actually, are we gonna be able to, to continue to see each other as one, as a single family? Or is this conflict that we're going through right now, is that going to create a true and lasting division by which these people and these people see each other as enemies. It's a scary place to be in. It really is. Okay. Lincoln wished to prevent that or to transcend it. I don't know how he would have said it. But he, he wished to overcome that danger as he led the nation. And he believed that giving thanks was at least part of what was needed to attain unity and healing and restoration for his people. Okay. 
what do you think of his proposition? Um, was Lincoln right? I mean, it's an it's a good question. Was he a fool to think that Thanksgiving could bring people together? And if he was right, if gratitude and thanksgiving and praise can heal a fractured and suspicious people, why might that be? Like, what is the healing and unifying mojo that is present within gratitude? I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> Like so many questions that I ponder, I, I really don't know the answer. I do find the scriptures to be illuminating and helpful with questions like this. Though I must confess that I rarely feel that reading the Bible uh, just answers my questions outright and puts some important issue or concern to rest. Um, the Bible is usually a big help to me. And it, and it helps me in my understanding. But it helps me by provoking and challenging me. So I rarely put the Bible down after reading some passage and feel like my issues are all like settled and resolved, you know. That's just the way it is, you know. But something that I find helpful in the passage, uh, like a passage like Psalm 100, which is the passage we read at the beginning of this message, I find it helpful the way the Bible makes people small. Yeah, the Bible makes us small. Human ambition, human perspective, human wisdom, human folly, human sorrow and struggle. It's all so small in the court of God. Or, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong way of putting it. Um, maybe it's not small. But as big as it is, God is much bigger. Okay. So the psalm invites us to praise and exultation and joy and singing and frankly humility recognizing our limitations and our smallness is key to all of the joy and the praise and the love and the excitement and the exultation that this psalm is inviting us to. Okay? So we recognize <laughs> that we are small. And that God is the Almighty. God is the ultimate. God is God, right? And we are but sheep grazing in his pasture. To know that we are so small, and yet that God looks with favor and loving kindness upon us, that should be the source of enormous and abiding joy and satisfaction. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Okay. The insight about thanksgiving that Psalm 100 gives to me is that when we are grateful, we are humble. Right? We take ourselves out of the center of things. You could say that this is actually the essence of thankfulness, right? That humility is the core, right? The recognition that the good which has come to you has not come from you. It's so simple. It's so important. But it's from this understanding, this, hum this humility, that we are able to direct our attention outward and upward right? You give thanks because you understand that you are not the source of the good that you are experiencing, whatever it is, okay? Now, people can be reticent to take themselves out of the center. People want to be in control. People want to believe that they determine what happens and to claim credit for good outcomes. Uh, but, but the truth is, humble gratitude the recognition that we are not the center of the universe is the key to so many of the things we wish for in this life, including our healing after being hurt. Because gratitude actually requires an important transformation. You can't be grateful and hateful at the same time, right? My hatred of an enemy it keeps me 
and my grievances and my focus on my enemy's transgression in the center of things. And I actually have to turn my attention away from the things and the people that I hate in order to focus on the grace of God and give thanks. You see how that works? Now, so it might seem that the practice of gratitude, because it is a humbling experience, limits our power. But that, that just isn't right. To be truly grateful, to fully practice thanksgiving, we must release our enmity and our contempt. And there is liberation in that. Now, I wonder if Abraham Lincoln perceived that gratitude was the way to release enmity and bitterness and contempt and hatred, to take power away from strife by turning hearts toward the praise of God. Is that what Lincoln had in mind? I, I don't exactly know, but it adds up for me. And I don't mind saying to you on this blessed good day that it is good to give thanks, not just because we owe God a little gratitude, right? And not just because the earth is full of goodness. Certainly, uh, giving thanks is not a, ver- a mark of virtue on our character scorecard. You know. But it is good to give thanks because it turns our lives in the right direction. Thankfulness facilitates an orientation of the Spirit, an orientation of the Spirit toward righteousness, toward grace, toward the miracle of life itself, and away from bitterness. When you think of it this way, you recognize that Thanksgiving, you know, it's not the whole project of healing and restoration, Like a nation will not be unified, a family will not be reconciled just by taking a moment to be grateful. There's a lot more work to be done than that. But in that work, we see gratitude is something we cannot do without. And so, we give thanks today, tomorrow, and on and on. Amen.